the National Money Show in Orlando, speaking with David McCarthy today, Kagans. Uh, Dave, I understand you have a few fascinating pioneer and colonial pieces. Yeah, I have, uh, I have three really cool pioneer gold pieces here that, uh, that I like a lot. And, uh, you know, I figured we could talk about those, learn a little bit about the history of the Wild West. Yeah, let's. So, uh, the first one I've got here is an 1849 Oregon Beaver, or Oregon Exchange Company 5. And uh, these guys were one of the very first groups that actually struck uh, coins out of California gold. Um, I, I'm pretty sure that these were probably struck in March or April of 1849, which is before a lot of the California gold coins were struck. And what, what happened was um, some of the first people to make it to the gold fields were uh, trappers from Oregon. So you had uh, you had a fair number of people who were up in Oregon doing uh, fur trade with uh, the uh, the Northwest Company, which was a British company. And when news of the the gold strikes started to hit, they came down into the into the California gold fields, got gold, and then went back up there. And you know. At the time that the gold strike happened, Oregon was not yet a state, it was a territory, and there was really no infrastructure there to speak of. Um, as a matter of fact, the city of, city of Portland today was founded on a piece of land that was, I, I believe, sold by someone so that he could come down to, uh, to California to, to find gold. But all of these people up there were doing trade with the, uh, with the Northwest Company, which is a British company. And the Northwest Company was paying a fraction of what gold was worth. And so a group of people got together who were involved with the territorial government. And they decided that they were going to strike coins for the territory uh, to combat the, the, the low prices that were being paid for gold by the British. And while they were preparing to do that, uh, Oregon became a state and states can't strike their own coins and so a private group of them got together and struck, struck five and ten dollar gold pieces which essentially um, regulated the trade of gold in Oregon to the point where you know no, the Northwest Company I think they were paying something like six or eight dollars an ounce for placer gold wow. uh, which on the East Coast would have been worth probably um, I think that they were paying, in 1849, $16 an ounce for Placer Gold, and I think the actual Amazing. value was probably somewhere closer to $18, $18.5 an ounce. So they were, they were getting their eyes ripped out by the British, yeah. and this was the solution. Um, it's one of the most popular Pioneer Gold coins, largely because of the design. Uh, they, they put a picture of a beaver on them, and it's, you know, it's kind of a cool, cartoonish animal. Um, the uh, the five and the ten have two different beavers, though. The five has, uh, I believe, the five has a male beaver. Yeah, the five has a male beaver, and the ten has a female beaver on it. Um, and you know, there are probably I don't know, thirty-five or forty known five dollars, and there's a handful of ten. All right. So the next coin that I've got is like one of the all-time great Pioneer Gold coins. It's an 1850 uh, Vaquero 10 struck by Baldwin and Company. Uh, it's called the Vaquero 10 because that's what Spanish cowboys were called. And it's got a picture of a Spanish cowboy on the front of it. And this particular example, it's the Harry Bass coin. It's the single finest known um, in PCGS MS64+, plus, and it's from a very early die state, so it's really flashy and proof-like. Um, I mean, it looks like it was just made yesterday. It's essentially perfect. It's an amazing piece. Yeah, and this is, this is one of those coins. Um, it's been, copies have been struck of these coins for years and years and years. There are uh, early 20th century copies that are worth thousands of dollars today and then um, one, of, one of the companies that was dealing with material from the Central America actually melted down some bars and struck copies of these coins that you know sell for over a thousand dollars today so you know this is this is the design of all of the pioneer gold designs this is probably the one that's really captured people's imagination the most and it's a really it's an interesting story the company um, 
The company was one of the most prolific coiners during the early gold rush. They, they struck coins in 1850 and 1851, and they were literally striking millions of dollars worth of coins. And then um, James King of William, who was a banker who dealt in gold dust and also a sometimes newspaper man, uh, had a group of coins um, assayed by Augustus Humbert at the United States Assay Office and printed the results. And as it turned out, you know, these coins had less than their face value worth of gold in them. Uh, you know, they were privately minted coins that were in circulation in California at the time. One of them, or one of the groups of coins was a group of Baldwins. And because they were worth less than their face value, it sort of caused a panic in, in San Francisco and they started melting these coins down and Baldwin actually was run out of town. He, he like basically snuck out in the middle of the night to avoid being lynched or, or, or something along those lines. And so what ended up happening um, in the wake of that, private gold coins were literally millions of dollars worth of private gold coins were melted down and Baldwins were one of the ones that hit the melting pot particularly hard. You know, today, when you look at what exists, there, there are a lot of Moffat pieces, there are a lot of assay office pieces, um, there are a lot of Wasp Molitors that are from after this initial panic. Um, and the reason we see those is because those were the coins people trusted. Those were the coins that tested the best. And all of the material that didn't fare so well in these assays Literally, they just brought it in, melted it down, it got coined into assay office pieces, probably. And so that's why when you're when you're collecting Pioneer Gold, um, you know some of these some of these coins, you know, there's there are coins out there where there's a handful, there are fewer than ten pieces known, and large largely those pieces are so rare, not because so few were struck, but because so many were melted. But yeah, this is absolutely a masterpiece of, of the coiner's art. And, you know, again, this particular example is as good as it gets. It's hard to imagine one being in better condition. It's fantastic. Yeah. And what's, what's the last piece that, that you'd like to share with well, us? Well, speaking of coins that really got melted down heavily, okay. um, I have probably, I mean, this, is, this, is, this individual coin is probably my single favorite piece of Pioneer Gold in the world. And, you know, I mean, I, I think about these things. I've seen most of the great collections of Pioneer Gold that exist today. Um, I've spent, you know, plenty of time in the Smithsonian pawing through their coins in hand. And so, you know, I, I have sort of a short list of very, very special coins. And uh, this is certainly in my top three. And what this is, is it's a Pacific Company 5. Pacific Company is one of the companies whose coins were definitely under value and definitely hit the melting pots hard. Um, the Pacific Company coins were actually one of one of the most debased coins in, in the in the assay that James King of William held. And um, it's pretty interesting today taking a look at what exists. Uh, there are a couple of tens. There are four fives that we know of, although one of the fives was stolen from DuPont in the 60s, which means it may never show up again, and if it does, it's gonna go into a museum. Um, there are no pure gold known two and a halves, although I have a two and a half that is, is lightly gilt that I sort of wonder might, you know, might have been made by the Pacific Company to rip people off. And then there are a couple of dollars, and the dollars for many years were actually thought to be silver patterns until uh, someone actually discovered that they were such debased gold that they were they were too pale to, to look like interesting gold. and so you know again Pacific Company you look at some of their coins and they're obviously not very debased and then there are other coins that contain you know maybe 60 percent gold and the story that tells me is that you know this is a company that probably started out with good intentions and as things progressed, they debased more and more and more, and then, you know, they got caught. And so these things were melted down in incredible numbers. And like I said, there are a couple of tens. There are, we've seen four of the fives in the last 150 years, and of those, only three are known today. Uh, one is this coin, one is in the Smithsonian, and one is in a private collection. 
This is far and away the best of the three, uh, like dramatically better than either of the other two. Um, what does know, the image represent? Well, it's, it's a cap and raise. The, the Liberty cap in the middle is uh, what they call a Peleus, and what it was is in the ancient Roman world, when a slave was granted their freedom, they were given this cap. And so it became one of the great symbols of liberty in the 18th century and was adopted by the United States. You know, if you look at any seated liberty coinage or any capped coinage, that's what the, the cap is on the pole on a seated liberty coin. That's the cap that liberty is wearing an uncapped coinage. And um, it was also adopted by the Mexicans in a much more similar design to this. And I think, you know, the Pacific Company, when you look at the style of the eagle and the style of this, they were, they were clearly taking a look at some Mexican coins that would have been um, commonly encountered in California. Uh, we don't know who they were. There's been some research done on them, and it's been suggested that maybe they were struck by Kohler and Company. The, the, <laughs> the style of the coin is so different from that that I don't think that's the case. I think it was a smaller private company. But there's absolutely no evidence as to exactly who was striking them. But this coin is, you know, it's, it's only very, very lightly circulated. It's, you know, an AU-58. It's never been cleaned or dipped or worked on by a dealer, so it has this absolutely spectacular uh, magenta and coppery toning, probably attesting to a relatively high amount of silver in it, which again is consistent with the story we're telling yes, it here. Is. Um, but it's flashy, and for my money, it's like one of the great designs. It's really, really artistic and, and beautiful. And, you know, it's really interesting when you find a coin that sort of has the confluence of artistic merit, beauty, rarity, and story. And this one's got it all. So, yeah, it's one of my appealing. favorites. Mine too. Yeah. Mine too. Yeah. Well, Dave, thank you so much for uh, just sharing a few of these stories with Absolutely. us. Fantastic. Uh, best of luck for the rest of the show. Thank you.